Anyway, thanks for inviting me, and also greetings from uh, it's my kitchen in North Yorkshire. So, um, <laughs> okay. Anyway, so, anyway, uh, I've been listening in. So it's been a very interesting uh, discussion. I think I need to say uh, the next slide. Do you have my slides up? Yes, they're up. We see them. Yeah. Okay. The the the, ne the next next slide, the second one. Um, really, I think uh, Mary and Agnes and Elwin probably said all the things I I was planning to say. So uh, I can so excuse myself but by not coming to all the detail, but a couple of things really. One, to thank uh, Marin and also Molly uh, for your work on the on the commission and the very useful set and clear sort of findings. And Elwin sort of talked a bit about how, how we can use those. Uh, I think the importance of focus on smallholders, but the other thing which, which is also important, which is coming out, is this is a, a report for all agriculture, not just developing. It's around how do we change and get sustainable agriculture in developed countries. Um, I now wanted to really sort of take a bit further forward on what as a bilateral that the United Kingdom is doing. And so sort of pick up from what um, Elwin's been talking about. You know, the UK is, you know, taking action. We've met all our uh, uh, commits, which we, commitments which we made at Aquila. We've committed over or dispersed about 1.2 billion on food security. So we are taking action. But I wanted more to sort of focus a bit on what we're doing around our international uh, climate fund. Um, so we go to the next slide. Uh, this really picks up on, I think, Molly, what you were asking Owen that last question, that we really see there are two actions. One is to get climate change into agriculture policies and programs. And Owen's spoken about some of the, the challenges of that. Uh, the second is how do we get agriculture into climate change policies and finance? Um, so more broadly, DFID is looking at how do we climate with all our development programs. So it's not just an agriculture issue. It's about how do we address climate change across the whole uh, development uh, programs. So what we see we need to do is, you know, you want to get uh, climate change into what we do. And as Owen was saying, it, it isn't business as usual. Uh, I did like his analogy around the, the uh, new wine in old bottles. I'm not sure how that would go down with... Um, mixing French and Australian and South African and, and uh, <laughs> wines from Chile, uh, but maybe, maybe it makes it better. Um, but so we really need to sort of get uh, climate change into what we're doing around the G8 and G20 on, on food security, uh, what we're doing in supporting uh, CADAP in Africa. Uh, again, the long-term issues are in research. You know, it, it is going to be business un unusual. So support to the CGIR climate change and, uh, and security program and other research is important. And then what is happening to a national level uh, in, there in terms of national policies, both in developed and also in, uh, in, in developing countries. Uh, then also, what are the multilaterals like IFAD, uh, the World Bank, uh, FAO, uh, WFP and other uh, institutions doing around bringing uh, climate change into what they're doing? Uh, then I think where we started on, on this particular the Global Donor Platform when I was involved a, a few years ago, we did focus a lot on the, the UNFCCC, the negotiations and NAMAs and NAPAs and climate finance. I think that's important, but I think we do need to do the two things, getting uh, agriculture policies right as well as um, the climate change policies and financing right. Uh, so next slide, please. So I really wanted to sort of come a bit to, to what the UK has been doing around the, sort of the climate financing side. Uh, after Copenhagen, uh, we committed uh, to uh, 2.9 billion pounds over three years for fast start funding. And there you can see that the, the, the split which we, we focused on, we're recognizing that adaptation is crucial. Uh, so 50% is going on there, 30% on low carbon, 20% on forestry and uh, to halt the deforestation degradation. So that's our International Climate Fund. It's um, we're now into the, into the second year of, the, of this program. I'm going to give you some more details. Next slide, please. Um, Elwin already mentioned the issue of value for money, but I wanted to focus on on results and results and results. Um, we are in times when you know finances are, are tight. Uh, we need to deliver on results. So for the International Climate Fund, these are our sort of headline indicators. You know, one is, it focuses really on the, on the people first. I won't read those, or, or perhaps it should be, because people might be listening. Uh, one is how 
making people better able to cope with the effects of climate change, uh, and then we've got access to clean and also sustainable energy. Um, and then on the environment, the tons of CO2 uh, reduced or avoided, uh, clean energy, the hectares of where deforestation and degradation have been avoided, and also the importance of valuing ecosystems. So those are some of our headline indicators that all the programs under ICF fo uh, focus on. But again, it is about taking action, and this is, I think, where picking up from the commission is um, action is needed. And also, I do like uh, IFAD's acronym ASAP. It also stands for as soon as uh, as soon as possible. So I think we do need to take action. Um, let me come on to a bit of, of what our adaptation priorities for for our for our climate funds. Again, we've got to, we set out to seven areas: agriculture, uh, disaster risk reduction, so water resource management, uh, infrastructure and urban issues, coastal zones, uh, social protection, and also the impacts of uh, of climate change on health, specifically around diseases and issues of malnutrition. So those are our focuses. I'm only going to now focus really on agriculture and what we're doing. Um, Elwin's already talked about the term climate smart, uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, we are using that and we're, we're using it uh, in this broad sense to say we want to achieve all these things. Maybe sometimes there will be trade-offs, but we want to support people's livelihoods, particularly smallholders, and to get economic growth, particularly uh, green growth out of agriculture. We obviously need the food that farmers and consumers need, and that's a global issue. Uh, improving people's nutrition, particularly for women and, and children. And again, adapting farmers to existing and future climate risks. This is where business unusual will start to change. The IPPC report has already highlighted that we're going to have increased um, droughts and floods, and this is going to impact on farming and farmers. Maintain the health of our land so it can main, maintain or increase productivity. The important aspect of, of biodiversity, maintaining our forests and, and not losing biodiversity. And then as a co-benefit, sequestering carbon into soils and biomass so we can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, that's what we understand by climate smart. And that, I think, is very akin to terms of sustainable agriculture. Um, sustainable intensification also, I think, comes under this, particularly when you take all those goals. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, next slide, please. So just one, one example, this is a, a very new program which was launched this, this year, uh, Climate is in Agriculture in Africa. It focuses a lot on conservation farming, the use of agroforestry and soil and water conservation measures. It's implemented by those three uh, regional organizations, Comesa, uh, EAC and SADAC. Um, and it's to support two million farmers and it's going to focus on results. So we're really wanting this to to reduce numbers of people suffering from food insecurity in Southern Africa uh, by up to 5 million and reduce malnutrition in children by 50%, particularly around reducing stunting. So that's just a sort of, uh, an, an example of what, what we're doing. Um, I wanted now just to sort of finish a little bit on what we're, what we're planning. Um, but before saying that, to just underline the costs of not doing anything, though, I think ID estimated that by 2050, that'd be about 5% of the world's uh, GDP. So it's a tremendous cost which we need to tackle. And it's also a human cost. Uh, so what are we doing? We're looking at developing new global regional national programs, um, looking at what the multilaterals are doing, and you know, looking at the program that if, if that is developing. Uh, also, crucially, is how do we engage the private sector? Uh, obviously, farmers are all small, small, medium enterprises, but how do we engage the whole private sector to deliver uh, and adapt agriculture and get growth. Uh, important to us, and this is for the Global Donor Platform and also other partners, civil society and private sector, how do we share lessons on how to adapt and how to scale up uh, these sustainable agriculture approaches? And also, we, we, we are looking for agriculture being included under UNFCCC and note that this is going to be again discussed in, in the COP at the end of the year in, in Qatar. Uh, we're also making sure we're joined up with links across to the G8, where the UK holds the presidency, and we're, we're maintaining focus on food security and pleased to launch a new alliance for food security and nutrition in, in, in Washington uh, last month. And also looking at what, Rio, what will come out of Rio in relation to the sustainable development goals around food and agriculture. 
And then importantly is the post energy framework. What happens after 2015? Um, thanks, uh, Molly and colleagues for listening. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. Okay. Um, I just one point to clear up. I missed uh, what you had to say about uh, the cost of not doing anything. Could you repeat that information, please? Um, it was estimated as 5% of the world's GDP by 2050 if we don't adapt agriculture to climate change. Obviously, it's a, you know, I, you know, I think it was done by IED a couple of okay. years ago. So we'll lose that 5% then. We'll, we'll have a 5% reduction. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't adapt if we don't, agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I missed that. Um, all right, open for questions and comments here. Uh, please, I think. Hi again, uh, my name is Hanna Wettersham, working for Swedish Cooperative Centre. Uh, I just want to bring back the discussion again to, to the UN uh, C and the prospects you see, because what I've seen so far, it's still very much focused on, on carbon credits and uh, getting more carbon finance and uh, having a trade on with carbon emission. Uh, do you see any prospects of, of, uh, of the dialogue there to actually be broadened and start in to talk more maybe about various uh, getting more money to those uh, green fund and adaptation fund etc uh, and what is your view on on maybe having an agricultural work working program yeah well i think that the uk's position is the same you know is obviously because of the eu we would like a work program on agriculture and it must cover adaptation and, uh, and mitigation so uh, the, the recent discussions in bonn at that almost reached agreement uh, around, around that. I think there is, and, and Owen's highlighted it, that people came into, into unit to proceed thinking around carbon markets in relation to agriculture. I think that is, the agriculture needs to be much bigger than that. And um, it's just a, a potential opportunity. And I think particularly for smallholders, the idea that carbon financing is going to be a a sudden quick win, I think, is, is, is maybe uh, misconstrued. And the issue is, particularly for countries, to focus on the adaptation mitigation side. Um, we are made, I think progress has been made in, in, in the C. You know, agriculture is being discussed. Um, maybe I'd flag a paper that um, uh, Molly and Marion, myself and others, wrote at the beginning of the year in science of what next for agriculture, because that sets out the political economy. Uh, around what we see around the negotiation. So there's a whole set of issues, and, and if you want to look at it, it's in the 7th of January in, in science. Okay. Um, has DFID actually increased its agricultural portfolio in recent years? Have, has, is investment increasing in agriculture yeah, related? It, yes, it is. I haven't, I haven't got the figures to hand. Obviously, we did make a significant commitment at L'Aquila uh, in 2009. Um, the money from the, 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 the International Climate Fund is this is this is new money. It's not sort of you know old wine in new bottles to go back to the Owens analogy. Um, so uh, and it is you know we're picking up from um, uh, from the US on, on food security and obviously uh, colleagues in France on the G20 and now Mexico are also looking at food security. So looking for the G20 to to take these forward. So I think you know we are looking to 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 increase our investments, and I think we have, we have, but I haven't got the precise figures in for me. That's all right. I, I was reading a news article here recently that the L'Aquila uh, L'Aquila initiative has only actually dispersed a little over twenty percent of the money it pledged in two thousand and nine. Yeah. Yeah. The the UK's we committed one point one billion, and we've actually dispersed one point two billion. Well, then you're on the happy side of the statistics. So, so we, we, we will be encouraging other, other members to, to, to also meet their commitments. Uh -huh. Encouraging. I like that. I won't ask you to define that word. Yeah, um, I, I, like, I don't have the details of which other countries have. Or have but obviously, it is challenging times in relation to some of the, the G8 economies and others. But yeah. uh, the focus is, you know, we can recognize the focus on smallholders and the food security effects of poor. Now is the time to to maintain investments and not to, not to reduce them. Okay. Uh, do we have any comments from the... Tw uh, yeah, okay. Matthew? Yeah, we had uh, one um, posing from the Twitter was, um, you mentioned, you said, how, how can we engage the private sector in development and growth in agriculture? 
and I was just wondering if you could tell us how. Um, well, let me give you an example. We're, we're supporting uh, the African Enterprise Challenge Fund, which is uh, managed by uh, out of Agra in Nairobi. Uh, uh, that's sort of contributing to, uh, to developing partnerships with the private sector, for example, in I think Sierra Leone. It's led to um, partnerships in some private sector and, and cocoa farmers bringing incomes to, to farmers. So uh, there's that area. Um, obviously, also. Um, in some of the programs, we have small and medium prizes. Uh, I think we've got some there from the cooperatives. So there's a whole set of others in that sort of private sector, civil society, uh, place where, where they need to engage. Obviously, markets and transportation is all, you know, in, in the private sector. Uh, and not just, you know, not talking about, you know, the sort of the large multinationals or the supermarkets, but, you know, the seed companies and the whole set of uh, actors who, who, who can really help uh, drive uh, growth and benefit livelihoods for smallholders, and also they also need to be thinking about how they ad adapt in the future to climate change. Okay, one more, yeah. Just got a, a follow up to that. What about the big businesses in the UK, for example, such as the large supermarkets? Shouldn't they also be becoming involved in this? I think the answer, answer, is, answer is yes. I think, interesting. I, I, that's not I went to, but there was a sort of a, a dragon's den thing around with um, what to do around development, and uh, it had the private sector, civil society, and, and one of the winning bids was actually came from, from Walmart Asda saying that, that they need to engage with smallholders and looking to source products from smallholders. Uh, obviously, there's a whole set of issues, but, you know, um, we need to source this, products from, uh, from developing countries uh, and need to be sustainable and ethical. So there is a big, you know, there's obviously a clear role for people like Asda and, and Tesco's and Sainsbury's and others. Um, we're also looking, you know, in, in Rio plus 20 for, for more sort of reporting on sustainability. So there's a number of examples like, you know, um, uh, Marks and Spencer's and others, there's Unilever's commitments. Uh, so that, so things are moving ahead and they do have a clear role to, to, to play. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I can see by the kitchen clock there that I'm running close to schedule. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we're going to have a, a brief wrap-up session.